So now it's time for part two of my conversation with Dr. Christopher Morrison. He's been awarded a NIAC grant for the lunar flashlight, which is another decaying isotope, in this case, a fairly small amount that would provide power to a lunar rover, but also serve as a science instrument on board the rover. So it could both survive the lunar night, but also drive into the permanently shadowed craters on the moon and be able to scan them for minerals. And there's other ideas on how this technology could be used. So it's a very fascinating conversation with Dr. Christopher Morrison. Enjoy part two of the conversation. Ember Core Flashlight, long distance lunar characterization with intense passive X and gamma ray source. So what is this? <laughs> so this is a science instrument that could potentially double as a power source as well. Um, and this is another example of scientists and technologists coming together and saying, what can we do? You know, as a technologist, you're like, oh, I... I want to go to the moon. You know how this started is we're we're looking at a a heater for the moon to help small rovers and landers survive the lunar night. And this this idea is it comes from the idea is what is the simplest easiest thing that a commercial company could build that doesn't necessarily rely on NASA, although we're we're happy to 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 have NASA use it or 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 help fund development of it, but it's a purely commercial product. What is the simplest, easiest thing that we can make that would still have at least a, a minimally viable business case for, for this application, right? You know, so there's a lot of problems in the nuclear industry where you start off with, hey, this would be really cool, but I want to build the, the best, highest performing, you know, Ferrari version of it. And they spend a lot of money and it gets canceled because it's, it's hard. So, so the effort here was to take the opposite approach. What is the simplest, easiest thing we can make? And the idea was, hey, it's an, an, a heater, just something that provides heat. And during the, the moon, uh, the moon has, uh, it's tidally locked around the Earth and it orbits the Earth, you know, about once a month, which means that the lunar night and day cycle are about two weeks long. Um, and two weeks of darkness and the darkness is really cold, by the way. It, it's it can get down to well under a hundred Kelvin if you're in a in a permanently shadowed area. To Fifty Kelvin, um, depending on where you are and what you're doing. It, it's really cold, and there's a lot of electronics that could hibernate through a lunar night if it was, you know, they could go down to microwatts of power and survive. But the problem is, it gets so cold, it damages their batteries, it damages their circuitry and components. And the simplest, easiest thing you can make is this heater that is just designed to keep things warm enough that it doesn't damage the thing and it can wake up in the next lunar day and go do some more science. Um, we see, for example, the Chinese uh, rover that, that are, um, that's on the moon right now that has plutonium on it that keeps it warm through the night. Um, anything and everything that has survived a lunar night on the moon on the surface has used a radioisotope. And all these commercial companies are saying, I'm going to go to the moon. Oh, and we're just going to be there for two weeks and then our thing's going to die. Right. You know, not, not, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's challenging. And this radioisotope that we're looking at, um, it's, it's actually got a pretty short half-life. I mentioned in the last talk about why short half-lives are good. It gives you a lot of power density, um, so this this heater it uses a radioisotope called thulium. You know it's TM-170 thulium-170, and it has some unique benefits in that for something about the size of a coffee cup, you can provide tens of watts of heat, and you know maybe even a few hundred watts of heat, and it's relatively easy to produce using um, kind of medical industry adjacent um, technologies. So when I mention Ember Core. Um, the basic concept is we have these little embers that we manufacture in a lab and we ship it to a nuclear reactor. And on the inside of the embers, the embers have an outer layer that's passive and an inner layer that's, when you put it in a reactor, it absorbs neutrons and turns into a radioisotope of your choice um, based on the material you put in there. So thulium is a really easy radioisotope to produce in this method. And um, it's it flips the paradigm of an RTG being a 
several, well, depending on who you ask, between 300 million and a billion dollars for an MMRTG. Um, you know, it's there's a whole wide range of prices, but it's a very expensive object. Um, you know, we're flipping the paradigm to saying, well, this could actually only be a few million or, you know, it, it can be very cheap and commercially accessible. And we go and we talk to the the, 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 all these companies and they're, they're excited about it. But part of the problem is, is all these commercial companies have customers, right? They have customers and, you know, they're not really selling their services yet to survive a lunar night. They're not saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to sell you lunar night survival, right? So it's hard for them to justify to their customer, hey, this is a business case. I'm going to make money. How do I make money off this? Um, how do I know that what you're making is even going to be real? And one of the thoughts is, how do we upsell this? How do we make it where the customer is interested in it? And, and when you look at a lot of these lander companies, a lot of their customers are NASA payloads or uh, others, a lot of space agencies, you know, not just NASA. It's, you know, the Australians, the Canadians, the, the UAE, the, the Japanese. Um, they all want to do something for their science program. And the, the idea struck that, hey, what if this heat source is also a science instrument? What if it does something useful for the end customer, the scientist? And all we would have to do, we've got this source of x-rays. And this is where NASA in the past, they've selected plutonium because it doesn't have the x-rays. It doesn't have the gamma rays. Yeah. X-ray is a gamma ray. I'll just quickly go into a little bit of side tangent. An x-ray is produced from electron shell orbitals from you knock an electron out and when another electron takes its place, it emits an x-ray. Um, the gamma rays, however, are generated from the nucleus, but they're both high energy photons and they both, they actually have overlapping energy ranges occasionally. They, they travel through objects and NASA has tried to stay away from those because those need shielding. They need an additional component that's pretty heavy. Um, in our case, um, however, we're saying, hey, how do we take this disadvantage and turn it into an advantage? So use those x-rays for science. And the basic concept is we have our heater. It's about the size of a coffee cup. We drill a hole, a hole through the shield, a, a small pinhole, as we call it. And now we have a flashlight. Um, I sometimes want to call it a laser pointer because the beam can be controlled to what someone might think of as laser pointing. But it's not a laser. It's not a coherent. It's not lasing like a, a, a laser uses kind of a gas and um, how it lases. But in this case, it's just a... A, a beam of x-rays that's coming out and on an on earth it doesn't travel very far because we have air it, it the air interacts with the air the air stops it but on the moon or in any mostly airless body even mars these would actually travel for quite some distance so you can think of this as you know if you're if you're looking for something you turn on your flashlight right you're looking for something well this is a flashlight just in a different spectrum of energy. And um, there are actually different isotopes with different different um, kind of X-rays and gamma rays that they emit. So you can actually tailor to a large degree what comes out. But a lot of the focus has been on the thulium. So thulium, uh, it has a, a really nice 84 kilo electron volt um gamma that it that it emits 13 percent of the time that it decays and this gamma is perfect for x-ray spectroscopy um, or spectrometry where, where you shoot out and um, you shoot out an x-ray if it's in the range of about one to a hundred kilo electron volts it has a very high cross section to interact with um, elements you have an element it has an electron shell orbital your x-ray hits it it knocks the electron out then another electron takes its place and it emits um, a fluorescence. So you, you hit it with your radiation, it emits its own radiation. But the nice thing about that radiation is like a fingerprint, that when it emits radiation, you can tell exactly what element that is. You can say, oh, that's definitely uranium, that's definitely iron, or you know, potentially that's definitely nitrogen or carbon or even hydrogen. Um, so you can use the X-ray uh, um, fluorescence. And then on the opposite end, there's something called X-ray backscatter. And in that case, um, the X-ray interacts with something and it um, 
gets knocked off. Um, sometimes we call it back scatter, so it'll come back towards you. Um, a lot of times it actually forward scatters. So the basic concept is you have two rovers. They drive up to one's a detector, one's one's an emitter, and they drive up to opposite edges of Shackleton Crater, and one has the source on it, and it's sh- it's very precisely pointing in different spots in Shackleton Crater down to the like let's say meter or even millimeter resolution, and it's probing. And some of these these X rays actually travel several centimeters into the surface, so potentially you can probe under the surface, not just the top surface. So you shoot down. You have another rover on the opposite side of the crater that's a detector. And you can say, oh, there's there's something really interesting about this spot here. It it gives us a different backscatter pattern that would indicate that you have lighter elements. Uh, What backscatter detects really well is the Z value of a material. So heavy elements and light elements will have a very different uh, reflection. Also density. Density and the Z value are what you can detect. So you drive up to the edges of the crater, you're, you're doing your thing, you detect, hey, these are the spots of interest. You then have a heat source on your rover, potentially an electrical source. Um, you know, if, if, if I want to be a little bit more fancy and say we put some thermoelectrics on it. And we can go drive down to the spots of interest. And as we're driving down, we point our source into the ground. So we get a line of, hey, there's a bunch of interesting things and data we've collected as we're driving. You get to your final destination and you say, well, now um, uh, I, I can be closer, get more, more data, and potentially I can power, I've got a heat source, I can possibly add it to a drill, or I've got a power source, I can power a drill, and I can go into it. So if you look at the Viper rover today, you've, I'm sure you've done some, some digging into the mm-hmm. Viper rover. The Viper rover is driving as fast as it can chasing the sunlight it's not really chasing like there's science objectives but that's secondary to surviving right you know it it might be we really (laughs) want to look at that crater but the sun isn't going to be there for long enough so we have to drive around it so think of um the viper rover today with the solar panels chasing the sun as fast as it can versus our rover that would be radioisotope powered that can drive up to the edge identify immediately where spots of interest are and drive to them and tell you, oh yeah, this is this is definitely water or not. So that that's kind of the, the big idea of this is let's right. use something that's traditionally not an advantage, which is radiation, to actually be advantageous for you. And this this idea of of having both a power source and a an illumination, a way to to create X-ray spectroscopic data, you know, these are two checklist items that most missions have on board of them. Like most missions that are flying out to places in the outer solar system or even exploring the surfaces of planets, like they need to have a power source and they have they need to have some way to do spectroscopy. Um, what's it? Curiosity has a laser to zap rocks. Um, and but there have been X-ray spectroscopy experiments on various missions as well. But it, it it sounds like this really starts to come into play when you're farther away from the sun, where you are in more and more darkness, like say you do reach that Kuiper belt object that you're you've found with your other mission, and you want to map it. This sounds like the right kind of instrument to be able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. You could definitely um, with with the extrasolar object, You've got this radiation source. Um, if you design it right, you could detect several centimeters into the object. Now, there will be a distance where uh, the x-rays don't go that far. Um, you won't really be able to get a signal. But um, I'll tell you a, an interesting story. Is there's the, the Soyuz has to deploy um, um, its parachute at the right altitude. And it also has, I believe, a a mechanism where it slows down right before it hits the ground with some kind of charge. So it has a Cobalt-60 power, uh, Cobalt-60 source that's used as an altimeter. As you get closer to the ground, it looks for the backscatter of the Cobalt, and that tells the computer, hey, I'm close to the ground, pop the pop the, oh, the, I no the idea. charge to slow me down right before you hit. It's called the Cactus, K-A-K-T-U-S. Um, they've been using it since the 60s. Uh, and, um, you know, that you can precisely map, for example, um, 
like distance is something you could look at. Um, uh, especially if you're kilometers away, you can actually do a time of flight measurement where if you had something like a shutter that you can open and close, you could say, how far away am I? I open it, close it, and I wait for, for the, the signal response. Um, there's um, a lot of different um, potentially like you can communicate with this object, you know, whether it just be, I dropped one of these off here. And if you look around, you can triangulate your position because you can see the one source here and the other source there and the other source there. So you know your position. Um, or uh, another one is communication. You could actually encode if you had something where you could actuate a shutter close mechanism. You basically have the capability to do Morse code. You can communicate like a time signal. And I actually met a guy who... <laughs> Uh, they, they put reflectors on a lot of the lunar assets, so that way they can shoot a laser out and try to figure out where they went. But you could potentially put a radioisotope on them, and you could detect them in the same way. So there's there's tons of, you know, what can you use radiation for? And for the Oumuamua-like object, my thought is, is what if you could be tens of kilometers away and scan the surface and, you know, figure out, hey, you can definitely do X-ray fluorescence. Uh, what the only challenge I see is um, if you do need a full shield, it could be quite heavy. So you're 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 adding mass to your system to properly. When you talk about observation, you got to have okay. I've got a beam. It has a certain signal strength. Um, it hits the surface. It emits a certain number of particles. I have a detector over here. Um, it's sitting here for a certain amount of time to detect those particles. So there's if you're just shooting out a big let's say shotgun blast of particles everywhere, it can be really hard to um, detect exactly where things are and exactly what they are. So there is a, a large element of signal to noise when it comes to doing these types of measurements. But um, yeah, it, it would totally, you know, in, in my mind, you know, Muamua, at the very least, you would be able to get maybe very granular or very um, coarse data of, hey, this definitely has iron. Like Oumuamua, we were wondering if it's, is it composed of hydrogen? Is it composed of nitrogen? Um, you could fly close to it and you'd definitely be like, oh yeah, there's a, there's all these um, uh, x-rays coming off the, from what I'm hitting. It's definitely composed of nitrogen or it's definitely composed of hydrogen or, oh, it's definitely an alien spacecraft, you know, or something <laughs> right. like yeah, that. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> I mean, you, you think about like all of the asteroids and, and the potential for asteroid mining in the future and each asteroid is its own special butterfly with its own mineral compositions on its surface. And, and again, like this idea of having a, a low cost X-ray spectrometer that you could send that is also the power source to asteroid after asteroid after asteroid. There's a ton of value in that. And you can imagine once the asteroid mining companies really get going, they're going to, they're going to buy shelves of these things if they, if they can to be able to do their prospecting when they're looking yeah. at the different asteroids. One of the so, things we're, we're looking at is a comparison of there is background radiation, cosmic rays and a little bit from the sun that um, they're not very strong sources, but they do emit um, some of these particles. So when you, when you mentioned a lot of spacecraft carry uh, spectrometers, it's because they're just looking down at Mars or looking down at the moon and they're detecting photons. But the, the problem with that is, is, is their, their granularity is like, well, we know that there's probably water here, but it's a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer area, right? You know, it's, we can't get a lot of signal. We don't know exactly, you know, like if you're going to try to land and, and, and go to the most useful spot, it's a lot of ground to cover to figure out, oh, here it is. So with these sources, one of the questions we want to ask is how granular can we get? How small can we get? Can we can we get centimeter precision, meter precision, or tens of meters precision? Um, and that's where a lot of the NIAC phase one uh, effort yeah. goes into is how can we prove that we're more useful than kind of current background scanning? And so that is the goal of the phase one in this case? Yeah, that's it's it's... It's a feasibility study, so I'm not going to sit here and tell you this is 100% going to work. Like I, I know it. Yeah, you know, after in about six months, I'll, I should be in a position where I can tell you, yeah, this seems pretty feasible. Yeah. Uh, but for now, it's more of a a a look at this. It seems like 
a lot of the pieces are there. Um, let's 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 prove or disprove that this is a, a real technology. Yeah, it's really exciting. Uh, well, Chris, if people want to keep track of the work that you and your team is doing, what's the best place to do that? Yeah, so you can go to our website, usnc.com, and uh, there's uh, uh, a page a whole, uh, dedicated to Embercore, which is this kind of radioisotope technology. So you can uh, keep track there, occasional press releases. Um, there are, um, you know, I, I'd be... Uh, for for someone who has like a science question, um, there's a contact us form, and you can definitely get a hold of me through through that and say, hey, I have a question, or I saw your your talk today. Um, I'd be happy to uh, to chat. I, I show up at a lot of conferences too. So next week, for example, is the Nuclear and Emerging Technologies for Space Conference. That's in Idaho Falls, Idaho. Um, so I'll be giving a few talks there. Oh, good. Um, it's highly likely I'll be maybe at SciTech or uh, one of the other um, big conferences. But uh, if you if you go to LinkedIn too, actually that's one of the easiest ways to get a hold of me is just look for Christopher Morrison Nuclear Ember Core, and you'll you'll find me on LinkedIn. Well, uh, Dr. Morrison, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today, and again, congratulations on two NIAC award that you're working on. Although also maybe that sounds tough, but hopefully you won't be too frazzled uh, trying to push both of these technologies across the finish line. So good luck exploring uh, outer space. Yeah. Yeah. Well, pleasure talking with you. Thanks for having me on. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word. There are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at university.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at university.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent and keeps ads at a bare minimum. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Paul Davis, Vlad Shipelin, Jay Dennis, David Giltanen, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Andrew M. Gross, and Josh Schultz who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.